We are continuing our sermon series called Victorious. Today, we're going to take a look at how Jesus gives us victory over fear. Before we do that, let's pray. O Lord, strengthen us this morning by the truth. Your word is the truth. Open our eyes to see what you want us to see. Open our ears to hear what you want us to hear. And open our hearts to believe what you would have us believe. Amen. The lesson this morning, it starts in John chapter 20, timeline-wise. This is an account that takes place on the evening of the very first Easter. Take a look, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together. Which, i got to be honest, this is probably the first year in my history that I've read this account on Easter and felt jealous. They were together. They didn't have to social distance. It's not like they had to get some kind of a text message group going just so they could stay in the loop. They weren't getting mass emails sent out. Uh, they didn't have to use Zoom or Skype or Google Hangouts or any of the 15 different brand new Hangout apps that are on the market, which, by the way, I was thinking about making my own. Uh, one where you guys can stay connected with me. We can video chat. I was going to call it Pster. Get it like pastor only Pster. You got to whisper a message. One thing about being in church, you don't know if anyone thinks your jokes are funny or not, so you just say them. So I just said it. Moving on. The disciples are together. But don't think that they're having a party. It's not as if they're hanging out and they're playing Parcheesi. It's not as if they're hanging out and they're eating salami sandwiches. It's not as if they're hanging out and they're watching old episodes uh, of The Office on Netflix. No. They are behind locked doors because of their fear of the Jews. Latch up top, deadbolt, one of those little chains, a little hook connected to one of those fish holes. Big old wooden bar, more chains, combination lock, one of the boots on the bottom, and a bunch of chairs, and maybe a table, and whatever else they got stacked up against the door. The doors are locked because they are afraid. And they are afraid because of the Jewish leaders. The same guys that hated Jesus. The same guys that plotted against Jesus. The same guys that had Jesus arrested. The same guys that had Jesus falsely convicted. The same guys that had Jesus brought to Pontius Pilate. The same guys that had Jesus nailed hand and foot onto a cross. The same guys that stood and laughed and ridiculed and scorned and mocked as Jesus died. And if you're a disciple, well, if, if they did that to the head honcho, if, if they did that to Jesus, the one with the actual miraculous powers? What are they going to do to us? Besides fear of being crucified, they were afraid for a lot of the same reasons that we're afraid. They're out of a job. They've been discipling for three years on, on, on the road to a fourth year. Uh, maybe a bonus. Nope, no more. Since they didn't have a job, how are they going to provide for their families? And if they go outside, are they going to get caught? Put their health on the line? Maybe people knew their families and their own families were in trouble. 
Maybe they'd get caught by the soldiers and brought to the Pharisees and put to death. And they thought this Jesus guy was the Messiah, the one that would save him, the way to the perfect life. And now, now what? The disciples were afraid. They were afraid because Jesus wasn't there. Here's the truth, truth number one. Without Jesus, fear reigns. Because think about it, if Jesus would have been there, I don't think they would have had the same kind of fear. Oh, sure, they're going to try and get us, those big Roman soldiers. Well, Jesus drove out a legion of demons. And are you nervous that we don't have enough money? Remember when Jesus, he pulled the exact amount for taxes out of some fish's mouth? And, oh no, we don't have enough food? Hey, Jesus, do that thing where you snap your fingers and five loaves of bread and two fish turn into enough uh, that we're able to field 5,000 plus people plus 12 baskets left over. If Jesus was here, there's no reason to be afraid. He could shoot a lightning bolt out of his finger. He could throw a fireball out of his hand. He could just transport them so they're surrounded by angels and living in bliss and harmony. If Jesus were there, there'd be no reason to fear. If Jesus were here, there'd be no reason to fear. But the truth is, Jesus wasn't there. He wasn't with the disciples. And without Jesus, fear reigns. Friends, I think we're in the same kind of danger here in America. As COVID-19 continues and the pandemic continues, fear reigns. People are terrified, they're frightened, they're angry, they're scared. And, and if I could submit... One of the main reasons that people here in America and even around the world are afraid is because they don't have Jesus. And without Jesus, fear reigns. And you say, well, that's a little presumptuous, Pastor Phil. How do you know? I know because of me. Did you know pastors get afraid? Sure, maybe some of the pastor's fears are specific to being a pastor, but yeah, there have been some things that I have been afraid of over the last month, over the last couple of weeks. Smaller things, right? I'm afraid that I'm never going to get a high five again. Or uh, maybe I'm afraid that I'm going to get so used to preaching between these two pews that I'm going to be like conditioned into staying put while I preach. I'm not going to walk back forth anymore. Some of you aren't afraid of that. That'd be a good thing, right? I'm afraid that we're going to lose some of our momentum as a church. I'm afraid those sanctuary updates we talked about may not happen. I'm, I'm afraid that the Durham church, the satellite church in Durham, that, that's going to pause. I'm afraid precious lambs might suffer. Afraid that we might lose some parents. Afraid that we might lose some workers. 
I'm afraid that a member of our church family might catch COVID-19. I'm afraid that if I'm out and about, I might pass on COVID-19. I'm afraid that because of quarantine limitations, one of us might get sick and I won't be able to be there before your final breath. And personally, our little girl, Daniela, down in Columbia, I'm afraid it might take months to get there. I'm afraid that she might get sick. I'm afraid that because she's immunocompromised, I might not get to see her. That is the way my heart feels when I'm apart from Jesus. Like when the devil does everything possible to separate me. Because without Jesus, fear reigns. But the devil can never separate Jesus from his people for very long. As long as Jesus lives, and he lives, he always finds a way back to his people, even when they can't figure out a way back to him. Jesus, yes, Jesus indeed, Jesus always finds a way back to his people, even when the doors are locked. Jesus came, stood among the disciples, and he said to them, Peace be with you. You know, when Jesus first shows up, Luke tells us this in chapter 24, he says that when he first shows up, they begin to think that he's some kind of a ghost. Um, they're frightened, they're terrified, because it makes a lot more sense that a ghost would show up to them than the actual, real, resurrected Jesus. And so, what does Jesus do? Well, it doesn't just stop with, peace be with you, but he gives them a reason for peace. He shows them, it says, verse 20, Jesus showed them his hands and his side. Here, you feel the little goosebumps? Uh, yeah, yeah. Take, take your hand right here. Feel that bicep muscle. How about this? Run your finger along the ridges of my scars, right where the nails were. Hey, want to see that spear-shaped mark in my side? Put your face right here. Do you feel how warm that is? Brothers, I am alive. You know what happens next? The rest of verse 20. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Like, catch that. Fear had filled the room. Because without Jesus, fear reigns. Fear had filled the room. And yet when Jesus enters the room, here's what he does. Jesus takes fear by the hand and he escorts fear outside the room. And instead, in its place, he brings joy. Here's the truth, right? Jesus replaces fear with joy. It's kind of like if you're working at a factory or 
Uh, you've been working long hours. It's about to be 5 o'clock. At 5 o'clock, who shows up? Well, your shift replacement, right? they got to keep the factory going. Maybe it's the factory that's making those masks, right? And so, okay, you're done with work, and you get to leave the room as your replacement comes into the room. Um, maybe you're at home. Mom and dad, you're at home, and you're there with the kids, and you're trying to entertain them, and you're playing with the Legos, and you're doing your best Smurf voice, and, and they're not laughing, and they're getting out of control, and the kids are starting to yell, and, and here comes your spouse, because it's their turn. Their turn to take their kids, and you can go hide in a closet, eat a chocolate bar. You leave the room, and they replace you. Here's what Jesus does. He takes fear by the hand, leads it out of the room, and he replaces it with joy. He says, are you afraid of lost income? Jesus says, I've got eternal riches for you that will never spoil, perish, or fade. You afraid of your lost job? Hey, I got a place in your kingdom and I have work for you to do right now. You have purpose and I love you. Are you fearful of the virus? Jesus says, I am stronger than any virus. In fact, I am stronger than death. You fearful you're going to lose your family. Jesus says, well, you're never going to lose your place in my family because you are a permanent part of this family. Are you afraid that you are alone? Jesus says, I am with you and I live and I will always be with you. Jesus replaces fear with joy. But that's not it. Because now that the disciples are no longer afraid, now that the disciples are joyful, Jesus has a job for them. Look at verse 21. Jesus said to the disciples, again, peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. He repeats himself, right? Peace be with you. And sometimes when people repeat themselves, maybe like, okay, that's enough. I don't need to hear that anymore. When Jesus says, peace be with you, I am not sure that there is a limit on the amount of times that I can hear that from my God. But I think there's a reason he says it right before he gives them a job. He says to them, peace be with you. Why? Well, if you're the disciples and you are afraid of the Jews because Jesus is gone and suddenly Jesus shows up again and your initial thought is, well, it's impossible for him to be here in the flesh. It's probably just a ghost or some kind of figment of our imagination. But then you feel his hands and his side and suddenly you're very excited because he's alive until you start to think about what that means. And suddenly something scarier, uh, something scarier is taking place than you could have ever imagined. Rather than being a ghost, this is real. And that's terrifying. Because the last time the disciples saw Jesus, it was like this. As they were running away. Letting them get arrested. Or Peter, last time he saw Jesus, right after he pretended he didn't know who he was. Or John, at least John's there at the cross. Watching silently. If Jesus really is back, he probably came back as a holy God. He probably came back to get him. Sinners. And so Jesus speaks to their heart one more time. Peace be with you. I'm not angry with you. God isn't angry with you. You had sinned, but that is why I died. I paid for all of your sin. You have no guilt and shame. You need not fear your sin. You need not fear the ramifications of your sins. Peace. Peace be with you. And now that I proclaim peace to you, go and proclaim it. 
Like, here's the truth, right? Peace-filled people proclaim peace. Can you imagine what it would be like once this quarantine is over? That's going to be pretty exciting. Picture yourself. Maybe you're sitting on the couch eating some popcorn. You're watching the news because that's what you do. And you watch the news. Suddenly across the screen, breaking a news alert. Um, crisis is over. Maybe the vaccine has been found. Or, or maybe it's opened up. We're not social distancing anymore. That's pretty exciting, right? Imagine that you're watching that TV and you're watching that scene and that news take place. And here comes your spouse and your spouse says to you, hey, anything interesting on? Do you respond with... Eh, not really. <laughs> well, no, not, of course not. Good news, the quarantine's over. And maybe you text some friends, you call somebody up, you do one of those Facebook lives and start doing some kind of post-quarantine dance. Like when you have good news, you want to share it. Friends, we have better news than the quarantine being over. Our sins are forgiven. Death has been defeated. Jesus lives. Proclaim peace. Pass that news on. Like, We've got amazing news that drives out fear in our hearts. Go, pass on that news to the others who are afraid. So what now? How do we do that? How do we do that? Let's turn our attention to a different part of Scripture. We are going to go to 1 John chapter 4. What is 1 John? 1 John is the first letter written by John. It's the same guy who wrote the gospel that we were just reading, which means it's the same guy who was an apostle of Jesus. It means it's the same guy who saw Jesus die and the same guy who saw him come back to life. He is the same John who was sitting in that room filled with fear and then had that fear removed as Jesus brought joy into his heart. John's going to talk to us about how to drive out fear in the hearts of others. Well, what's the answer? Well, well John's a pretty, good, he's a pretty good person to turn to. He speaks from experience. He knows how to drive the fear out of the hearts of other people because he himself has had fear driven out of his own heart. Take a look at what he says. 1 John 4, verse 16. God is love. He who remains in love remains in God and God in him. In this way, God's love has been brought to its goal among us so that we may have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world, we're just like Jesus. There's no fear in love. But complete or perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. First line, powerful sentence, right? God is love, love is God. Notice it does not say God is fear or God is terrifying or God is anxiety or God is nervousness or God is hiding underneath your bed because he might come get you. No, God is love. It's why God came down to earth. He died on the cross to take away all of your sins. God is love. So, okay. Okay. What do we learn from God? What do we learn from John? When it comes to driving fear out of the hearts of our family and friends, well, number one, if you want to drive fear out of your friends' hearts, be sure to, number one, fill your heart with God. Because it's really hard to be loving when you are afraid. Do you remember my dog, Frankie? I think I've talked about her before. There's a sermon not long ago. We talked about how she is terrified of laundry baskets. And since we've been at home, quarantine, doing 15 loads of laundry each day, because, hey, I think it was out in the closet for like two hours. We've got nothing else to do. Let's do some more laundry. Um, she's, she's not getting over her fear of laundry baskets. Here's the thing about laundry baskets. Like, she loves to be petted. She loves to love on you, to come lick your hands, to, to cuddle up next to you. But if you bring out the laundry basket when she is afraid, it is very hard for her to be loving towards you because she's too busy running away. And it's the same thing with humans. Like if you're afraid of the coronavirus, it's hard to be loving to your family because you're too busy dealing with your own feelings. It's hard to be loving to a neighbor because you're too busy being afraid in your own heart. If you want to drive the fear out of someone else's heart, we need to drive the fear out of our own heart. How do we do that? 
First John again, verse 16, he who remains in love remains in God and God in him. Because remember, God is love and love drives out fear. I saw a great illustration of this. Fear is a lot like air in a cup. Like, you can't see the air, but you know it's there. If you wanted to pour the air out of the cup, you could try, you could turn it upside down, you could even crush it, but the air is still there. And it's the same way with fear in our hearts. Like you can't always quantify it, and yet you know that it's there. And try as you might, blurting it out or numbing it by watching hours of Netflix or maybe getting revenge on someone who upsets you, the end result, fear is still there. So how do you get fear out of your heart? Do you know? You fill your heart with something else. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says perfect love drives out fear. That means the only way to drive out fear from your own heart is to fill your heart with Jesus. With his perfect love. This is something I say often, but, but, but for real, if you want to drive the fear out of your heart, the fear you're experiencing from COVID-19, the coronavirus, everything that's going on, spend more time with Jesus. Like be here in worship, absolutely. Maybe watch this again. Or watch some other church service online. Go for it. That's fine. Go ahead. Other pastors that got good things to say. Um, uh, find some Bible study time in the morning. Maybe add five minutes in the morning. Maybe do a devotion in the afternoon. You got a devotion in the afternoon? Maybe do a devotion in the evening. You got a devotion in the evening? Well, go ahead, add in a Bible reading before bed. You could even do this uh, on the Bible app. They got this one guy who he reads the Bible. It's a great combination. It's God's word plus this guy, he's got a voice. It just soothes you, calms you down. It drives the fears out of your head and your heart as you lay down to sleep at night. If you're serious about driving the fear out of your family's heart, you've got to start by driving the fear out of your own heart. And how do you drive the fear out of your own heart? Well, you fill it with the one who drives out fear with his perfect love. That's Jesus. Number one, fill your heart with Jesus. Number two, live God's love. Verse 17 says this, In this way, God's love has been brought to its goal among us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because in this world, we're just like Jesus. Remember, God's love is a lot different than human love. Like human love is often about emotions and butterflies and sparks and fireworks. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. They just started the new season of Bachelor. What's it called? Bachelor Music in the Night? No, I don't know what it's called. It's got like musicians. Guess what? A lot of people with feelings that are here today and gone as soon as the camera turns off. God's love is a lot different than that. You see, human love is often an emotional reaction to something. God's love is an action despite an emotional reaction. Because I don't think that when God looks at your sin that he gets butterflies in his tummy. No. Nah. There aren't any sparks when he's hanging on the cross. God didn't feel romantic love towards you. While he's dying for you. But he did it anyway. Because that's real love. Real love is an action despite emotional reactions. And as a holy God looking at our sin, God has an incredible reaction. He hates it. And yet his love for you, he dies and he rises triumphantly. He performs the most godly, the incredible action of dying to take away your sin. 
Friends, that is the type of love God is calling us to show to our family, to our friends, to our neighbor. Understand, God is not calling you to have butterflies around your neighbors. No. (laughs) He's calling you to perform actions of love despite how you might feel. Because that's his love. And his love drives out fear. It means getting up from the couch, performing the action of doing the dishes and scrubbing them clean. Even if your spouse didn't ask you to do it all that nicely. It means getting down on your knees, giving your children a hug. Even if they're kind of driving you bonkers. It means smiling, waving, asking your neighbor how they're doing, even if that same never neighbor never smiles, nor waves, nor has anything nice to say toward you. It means texting your coworkers to see if you're okay, even if they're the type of coworker that mostly just uses your name to badmouth you in front of the boss. It means calling up grandma, seeing how she's doing even if you'd rather be sleeping on the couch. Live God's action love. But that's not it. Number three, if you want to drive fear out of people's hearts, well then speak the gospel to them. Verse 18 says, there's no fear in love. Remember, God is love, so there's no fear in God. But complete love or perfect love drives out fear. That's a statement, this perfect love idea that can be hard to look at. And you say to yourself, well, I don't have perfect love. I have imperfect love. I have a love that is failing. But we're not talking about our love. We're talking about God's love. And God's love is made perfect when Jesus dies to take away our sins and rises triumphantly to prove that he did so. It's a perfect message of God's perfect love that perfectly drives fear from our hearts. And it is that same message that we need to share with others to drive fear out of their hearts. That's the, like Jesus is the message, not, I'm sure it'll be okay. Not, well, uh, it says that there's kind of a slowdown in the curve. No, the message that's truly going to drive fear out of anyone's heart is Jesus lived for you. Jesus died for you. Jesus rose for you. Jesus promises you heaven. That's the message that we need to share. Christ is risen. He's, say it with me. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. We've got a message that remains true in spite of everything that's happening. And that is the message, the message of Jesus that will drive fear from other people's hearts. Do you remember earlier I was talking about some of the fears that I have as a pastor? And I said, this is kind of how my heart feels when the devil is getting me to remove myself from Jesus. Right? Without Jesus, fear reigns. Well, I was talking to a pastoral buddy the other day and kind of sharing with him some of the things that I was concerned about, things that were causing me a little bit of fear. And he listened. That was nice. Even if he didn't want to, there you go. Living God's love, the action of love, despite his feelings. Finally, when I got done, you know what he said? So you'll be okay then. Because even if all that happened to you, you still have Jesus. He still lives, he still conquered death, he still conquered sin, and he will still bring you home to heaven. And I wasn't afraid. Not anymore. Because without Jesus, fear reigns. But with Jesus... Fear runs. Amen.